in training, we have a lot of focus on intensity control. We started just using heart rate monitors, but now it's power meters in cycling, in running, is a lot of lack of testing and measurement. Uh, we use uh, oximeter when we are at the altitude camp. So I, I think that in one way we are really, really strict in intensity control and how to build up the program and how we should train them. The Triathlon Show 154. Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, I interview Adil Tweiten, who is the head coach of the Norwegian national triathlon team. If you follow the draft legal triathlon scene, you know that on the 28th of April, uh, Norway, and that is 2018 for anybody listening in the future, Norway became the first nation ever to sweep a podium on the men's side in a World Triathlon Series event. When uh, Kasper Stornes, Christian Blumenfeldt and uh, Gustav Eden showed the world what this Norwegian train uh, is capable of. So what we'll talk about with Adil really is... Uh, a lot of his training philosophy that has helped transform a country like Norway to to become one of the triathlon superpowers almost, with very limited resources, with a non-existent history in triathlon and triathlon culture that exists in some other countries, with a climate that is not conducive for great triathlon training, etc. They have still managed to become successful, and I was curious to know how they managed that. And it is clear from talking with Adil that they, they do things quite differently from from a lot of other uh, countries might do and federations and uh, the elite athletes on the uh, on the draft legal scene and the olympic uh, olympic cycles etc so it was very fascinating to talk with Adil and the things that we talk about the training concepts they are definitely applicable for age group athletes just as they are for elite athletes so it's a fascinating discussion stay tuned but just quickly, before we dive in, let's thank our sponsors. This episode is sponsored by Stack that you can find on stackzero.com. Stack is a manufacturer of three different bike trainer models. They have the base, they have the power meter, and they have the Halcyon smart trainer model. And basically the way it works is that base is the, the cheapest one and it uh, has everything that you need from a trainer, especially if uh, you are more of a beginner, you're getting started, you don't need all the bells and whistles. It's still zero noise, zero wear on the tire. It folds flat, less than three inches high, so it's light and portable. Uh, and these things apply for all the different models. But then with the power meter model, you also get the uh, the power meter built in in the trainer. So even if your bike doesn't have a power meter, you can connect your your bike trainer with your watch and get power numbers and train with power just through having that, uh, that built in in the trainer itself. So you can use it with third-party apps, etc., the only thing that that uh, trainer can't do, that the, the smart trainer, the Halcyon model can do, is that the Halcyon can be controlled so that software, external software, can automatically change the resistance. So for those of you that uh, may want to take the step up to the smart trainer functionality, the Halcyon is definitely the way to go. It won the award for the best product in uh, the bike accessories category at Eurobike 2018. So that's a very big award. Because not only did it beat all other new trainers on the market, but it also beat a whole range of products from various product categories that can fall under the very broad umbrella of bike accessories. So you can find all of those on stackzero.com and I'll link to it in the show notes. And if you want to, to buy any of the models, use the promo code TTS20 to get 20% off your bike trainer. This episode is also sponsored by Ventum that you can find on VentumRacing.com. Ventum is the bike manufacturer that is really disrupting the bike industry with radical super triathlon bikes, forward thinking and a customer first approach and direct to consumer sales model to remove pricing markups from distributors. 
at the time of this recording, I'm just a couple of days away from getting the Ventum Z bike that I have ordered, which is uh, a super bike at an entry level price point, really, which is uh, what I can afford these days as a triathlon coach and not an engineer. Uh, so, as I mentioned, I'm moving more towards focusing on non draft racing. And uh, you can bet that uh, I'll look forward to actually, as part of this, getting on an actual time trial bike rather than on my road bike with clip on aero bars that are on top of that quite short because they are uh, draft legal racing approved. So, very short aero bars. I expect to gain significant speed uh, not only from going to a TT bike overall, but especially since the TT bike that I'm going to is a Ventum because I know that the Ventum is super aerodynamic to begin with. But also, it is set up. It basically it's exactly the same bike as the as the Ventum One, the flagship model. It's from the same mold, but slumped, slightly different materials. But it has the integrated hydration, which I think is key because not only make, does it make it easy to carry hydration without impacting aerodynamics negatively, but it will also allow me to stay in that aerodynamic position very well throughout the race and not lose aerodynamics through having to sit up, get my water bottle from behind the saddle or whatever I might do otherwise. So that integration is really one of the reasons that I love Ventum bikes and that I think that they are really fantastic and I can't wait to get on my Ventum C. I'll definitely report back in a few episodes time when I've had the chance to get on it and follow up with my personal experiences from it. But if you want to order your Ventum bike, Ventum has a special offer for that Triathlon Show listeners. You can get a free upgrade on your wheel set from standard training wheels to Edco Aerosport G065 race wheels when you order your Ventum bike and use the promo code that Triathlon Show, all one word, all caps at checkout on VentumRacing.com. Note that this offer cannot be combined with other offers, and also note that you won't see the change at the checkout page, but Ventum will, will be alerted to make the change when you apply the show uh, the code. So it doesn't even matter if you have some spelling mistakes in there, I don't think. All right, so let's get right into my interview with uh, Arild Tweiten. Today's guest on that triathlon show is uh, Arild Tweiten, who is the head coach of the Norwegian triathlon national team. So, Arild, welcome to that triathlon show. Thank you. I'm really glad that you want to host me, and I'm looking forward to this conversation with you, Michael. Me too. I'm very much looking forward to this. Uh, to start with, just an interesting anecdote. This March, March of 2018, I was in Quartera for the European Cup race. Uh, that was uh, one of the first races of the season. I was injured, so I wasn't racing, but I was watching. And uh, in the under-17 version of that European Cup race, uh, there was uh, this Norwegian guy who was uh, winning it. And uh, I made a prediction to my coach. I was with my coach, who uh, himself coaches some very promising uh, under-23 athletes uh, on uh, the uh, draft legal scene. That, uh, hey, I think Norway is going to be the next triathlon superpower. And then just a few months later, in uh, May, I think, you go and sweep the men's podium in the World Triathlon Series race in Bermuda as the first ever nation to have done so before other nations than like USA or Spain, etc., that you would imagine would be the first candidates to do so. So can you just start by telling us a little bit more about yourself, how you got into triathlon and coaching, and then we can discuss uh, the training that uh, led to this moment of really putting Norway on the map as uh, as a really strong and powerful triathlon nation internationally. Yes, um, I-, I can do that. Um, it was in some ways uh, a little by coincidence. Uh, uh, I used to be a triathlete, or okay, uh, at least do one race a year, uh, and I've done that for more than 30 years. I do my first race when I was 16 and now 48. Um, so, so my approach to, to, to coaching was from my active background. Um, I was a member of the national team in the early 90s. Uh, not uh, very good and very high level, level but I, I was on the team. And um, yeah, I was racing back then. And uh, uh, after... In a way, uh, my car- career was not so going so good in triathlon, so I followed to to, to a job and uh, yeah, you know, normal civil life, and um, and it was 
little bit by coincidence, I said, because in, um, in the, around 2002, I started working for a Finnish company, Polar, hardware monitors. And I was in charge of the sales, of course, in Norway. And I was also starting, studying much more about how the intensity control in training, because heart rate monitor was the big thing to use in intensity control. And I started to, to use that, of course, and um, was getting more and more interested in it. And I was working with it. So I thought, this is something I could do with the coaching. Uh, so I started doing a little bit coaching of the age groupers um, uh, on the side, uh, beside my other job, and uh, start using heart rate monitors as an intensity control tool. And um, I find that very interesting. And uh, after a few years, I was asked if I want to start to work uh, a little bit with some young Norwegian athletes because I want to, to build up uh, the federation with some... Um, yeah, with some new athletes working with the Olympic distance as a goal. And, uh, Which year was this? How, how long ago was this? Oh, that was in 2010. Okay. Uh, but uh, at that time, I have to say that I was not too, too interested because I had a good position in Polar. I did, did a little bit of coaching of age group and then the age group uh, had the money to, to pay for the service and they are not so demanding. So I was quite comfortable with that. But, uh, but, but then I was joining a, a training camp in them and uh, that time it was not a big structure. It was not anything. It was just that I put together all young athletes in Norway who maybe wanted to try out triathlon one day. And that was around 25 young people. And uh, I was there attending that weekend. And so there was a lot of potential, a lot of good athletes. And uh, so uh, maybe I can get a little bit more involved. And then after that, they asked me, okay, can you start coaching? Uh, we have young one young athlete which we think can be really good. Uh, can you start coaching him right now? I said, okay. Uh, who is it? It, it? And that was Christian Blumenfeldt. So I started working with him in 2011. Uh, then he was uh, 17 years old. Uh, very young, promising athlete. Uh, but his training was not structured at all. So we started working with some basic thing and we, I get to knowing, we get to have some structuring things. And and he was having huge improvement uh, at the first, from the first day. Uh, we, we were maybe doing a little bit too much or we doing some mistakes, but uh, it, it was, uh, uh, yeah, it was, it was a good start. Uh, and after a few months, the Federation asked me, okay, do you want to join us as a position as a, a sport director and head coach of the Federation? Uh, and work with all the athletes and build up the team and you can do whatever you want. We don't have so much money and we can just pay you 50%, but you can do whatever you want to to see if you can make anything happen. So I said, okay, that could be interesting. But then at that time, my former wife, I'm divorced now, she was expecting uh, twins. So it was, okay, should I go from a very well-paid job to, uh, yeah, to half position, possibly working full time. At the same time as my ex-wife was expecting uh, twins, I was really going drag a little bit back and forth and so okay, I will go for it. And um, and after that, then I will look back. Uh, and besides that, as I said, I, I used to have a triathlon background. I have no formal, form, formal education in triathlon uh, coaching uh, at that time. Uh, since that, I have taken a lot of the uh, coach uh, seminar and uh, courses we can do in Norway. So uh, now I'm uh, the highest educated uh, coach level you can have in Norway. Uh, but when I started, I have actually no coaching background. <laughs> l l learning by learning by doing that that's the best way to uh, the, the best way to learn anyway. Yeah, uh, we have of course done a lot of mistakes during the year, but. Uh, I think in during the yeah, these six years is mostly going the, the right directions. Yeah. 
so uh, so you started working with Christian Blumenfeld in uh, 2011 you said and uh, so so it took him many years to become the overnight success that <laughs> that he became uh, at one point when I I remember distinctly seeing him try to run with Mario Mola in a WTS race for a few years ago 3 years ago or so maybe and and that felt like that was when people were starting to to notice this uh, this young man and how strong he became but now this year and slowly but surely but uh, to many i guess it seems like still quite a sudden progress yeah. to now have also gustav and uh, and kasper uh, have taken podium places in bermuda and also other great results yeah. and you've had podiums in european cups etc yeah so how sudden is it really how how has the progress happened and why are you now starting to see the rewards of of the work that you put in uh, as I say, it is more like step by step, but, but it's actually funny. I, I mentioned uh, when we put together all the young athletes in Norway in 2010. That was around 25 athletes, and that was everyone in Norway who wanted to do triathlon. Out of this, we have four on the national team today, and one is also a coach. So it's five of these 25 is still a part of the national team. Uh, and that is uh, quite a huge success, I think. And um, from that, we are just taking a step by step. Uh, from day one, you have, of course, Christian, we have Casper, we have Gustav, uh, also Lotte Miller, um, and we also have Jürgen Gunnarsson. All of these were, were the base at this training camp in uh, October 2010. It's exactly ten, uh, eight years ago now, these days. So from that on, I've been working with them on from on daily basis. Um, not that I see them all the time because they are located in different places in Norway, and I'm in located in Oslo. But I've been making the program from day to day basis. Uh, in the beginning, it was like more like uh, cooperation with uh, the swim coaches and uh, put them into a. Uh, uh, track and field club, so we can do the running there, and now we're making the overall program. But after, as I've grown and getting older, we're taking more and more control of what they do in every training. Of course, we have more camps, longer camps, we have altitude camps, but also when they are back in Norway now, we are taking them out of the swimming club, so we have an, one coach who's doing all the swimming training with them, so it's, everything is, do, we are doing what we think we need to do. Uh, on every training session as we don't compromise in anything yeah, but in the beginning it was like okay you swim in the swim club and uh, these days you can do running with the interval uh, with the running club and and I, I put in some extra session I can do besides that but that was the start actually so as I said it is more like step by step and if you don't know the background or, or let's see if in Bermuda you see just Casper coming from out of nowhere, it seemed like, wow, how can that happen? But since I've been working with him on a daily basis, I know that he's taking a lot of small steps all the way. And um, he's not always see that in, in the races. But um, as you see at the start of the season, you were in Kataira. You see where he was third in, in, in the European Cup and he was running with the good uh, French guys, uh, Leo Berger and Dorian Koenig. So you, you know that he was like, capable of performing at a high level and uh, in Bermuda yeah of course he get a breakaway on the bike because no one take him too seriously and there we won so do you, you in that step-by-step -step process do you think that there are some main contributing factors because it's a big success rate to have four athletes out of the 25 that were at that initial training camp become international level triathletes let alone podium finishers and wts winners so so what what would you say are the main main success factors or factors behind the success that you've had it's a lot, lot of small things but i think we have to do with a lot of motivated young athletes that is one thing so they they actually do what you tell them they need to do. But I also think that in training, we have a lot of focus on intensity control. We started just using heart rate monitors, but now it's power meters in the cycling, in running, it's a lot of lack of testing and measurement. Uh, we use uh, oximeter when we are at the altitude camp. So I, I think that in one way, we are really, really strict in intensity control and how to build up the program and how we should train. And, uh, for me, it's more like I think that we 
we do what I think we need to do. But when I see other training groups, I see that we pay a lot more attention to these details than all the training group I see from outside. It, it, I could be wrong, but I see that we are really focused on that one. And um, what we do is we, we know what we are doing. And it's all about maximum training load. But in a good way, you, you actually need to, to, to train at the right intensity and uh, get the purpose out of the training as you are planned to do. There's a lot of people do that really can, can, can you give an example <laughs> of how you are specific with uh, training at the right intensity? Uh, how, how are you, for example, are you more often pushing up to the right or are you holding back down to the right intensity? Or just give an example of how that can play out. It, 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 is, it is much more of holding a little bit back. Uh, if we're going out for a long bike ride or running, is we, we need to be below 1.0 in lactate, and that that is no. Uh, but also when we do, for, uh, I think one of the main thing is when we do intervals. A lot of people do quite hard intervals uh, at a race pace or even higher on the race pace. But for us, it's not on be on the right hand intensity. So for most often it's going down. So for instance, we know that the individual threshold for, uh, for instance, Christian, when he is running, is in lactate is 2.5, 2.6. Then he will never ever do running intervals with the lactate of 4 to 5 most of the year, and especially not in that altitude. And, and since we know that Threshold, we know the pace, we know the lactate on it, and also the wet, wet that you need to power, uh, power, of course, you need to use on the, for instance, on the run on the bike. He can be really, really strict. It's not like, oh, today I'm feeling great, I'm going pushing much harder. He's got always control. Hmm. But then, of course, you have some training session towards the season or in the races, you can, yeah, do whatever, go as hard as you can, but mostly very strict control and mostly going down a little bit. So, so, so does does that mean that you often want to in even in in intervals you want to hold them at or below the lactate threshold? Actually, yeah. Um, for us, is one of the main principles, and that is obvious in my uh, eyes, is that triathlons and endurance sports in, is an aerobic sport, and it's about building the anaerobic threshold to the highest point, and then you need to train at that level or up to that. So we don't pay so much attention to what we do above threshold. Mm. Of course, we do race or, uh, race pace, and over, but most of the interval session is at the, the lactate threshold. Yeah. So instead of, uh, we, I see a lot of athletes go, uh, go to the track and they're running six times 1,000 in 240 and they're also happy. My athletes uh, go to the track and they then run 15 times 1,000 in uh, 305 and they're happy because that's the right intensity. For yeah, uh, I I know. Like personally, for example, as an athlete, uh, I definitely respond much better to staying at or below the lactate threshold. And uh, a lot of the athletes that I coach as well, I see that in them. It varies a little bit. But an interesting thing with you being Norwegian and a lot of the research coming out of Norway with polarized training uh, from uh, uh, Professor Steven Seiler, <laughs> do do you pay attention to that? And what's your take on on yeah. that uh, on on that topic? Uh, that, that is uh, something me and uh, Steven Silo want to de- discuss uh, about because you can see that in in one way our training is polarized in that way we have a lot of is a lot of volume and lower volume on uh, low intensity uh, but um, it, but it, it is not the way that he described the polarized training because we are not going so high on the intervals yeah but we are going low on the volume so 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 we. It is a little bit of the. It is a, in a way a polarized training principle because you have a lot of volume and the, most of the volume is at a low intensity. But uh, we are not going so really high on the hard training. Yeah, he he has a great presentation where he has a pyramid and the bottom yeah. layer of the pyramid is that volume at low intensity and then the second layer is the intensity and that's where I think that you differ where you have slightly lower. High intensity, and he yes. goes more to the higher side. Uh, yes. Okay, uh, very yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah, that is the main uh, difference, uh, and and I think um, one of the main things about that is if you see about the polarized training principles in Norway, is 
uh, you, you see a lot of example of cross country skiers, uh, mm -hmm. and, and their racing time is except when they do in the 50k is much shorter than a triathlon. And uh, the way they're racing cross country skiing now compared to former days is, is it is very high intensity at a shorter period of the time, and then you have a little bit resting period. So th that means that they need to do more higher intensity training than they need to do 20 years ago, because that's the way of the uh, developer of, of that sport. So, so a lot of the research in Norway is based on what cross country skiers are doing. And they have a lot of good principles about the volume and the low intensity, but it is, it's not everything we can put and use in Triathlon because it's, it's a kind of a different sport, of course. Yeah. Uh, so I think we have gotten a really good overview here of your training philosophy. Do you have? Can you go into some more details on the different disciplines, like uh, how you structure the training on the swim, bike, and run specifically? Yeah. Yeah, yes. Uh, okay, that is of course a very complex uh, question. <laughs> um, uh, in one way, it some of the same principles in all disciplines. Uh, in swimming, I think we do quite high volume compared to most other um, uh, triathletes. Uh, normally, we do around thirty-five to 40,000 meters a week. And it's a lot of, that is, of course, low intensity. Uh, but, 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 you know, on, in swimming, we do a lot of threshold set there, uh, but then we also do a lot of the, the sprints to, to have some of the maximum speed. And, um, but, but that's mainly that. Uh, and, and, but we try to do, when you do threshold set, we do longer intervals. We don't, we of course do 100, 200, but we can, for instance, do three times 1500 meters or 3000 meters all in all at the same intensity so we try to have longer distance in continuously swimming that is one of the big things we have done lately um, in our swimming training uh, but of course you know that the start in triathlon is extremely important so we need to have the speed also so we of course do some a lot of sprints and not a lot but we do some sprints um, and yeah that is the main thing, and uh, many athletes coming to a camp with us that, that will be surprised that we normally do around 6,000, 6,500, at least 1,000, 7,000 meters session each week, and the shortest one is maybe 5,000, so, and we do it at least six times a week. So, I think most athletes from other country trainers, that find that volume quite high and uh, higher than they're used to. We can always discuss it. Is at the point of doing it because one of the things about coaching is try to, to find the maximum um, training load and that necessarily doesn't mean that you need to be more. Mm. And uh, when we uh, try to mix up all the disciplines, it's always a mix is how much can you do in each discipline. But normally we, we, we do that in swimming. So that is in one way or base. Uh, in, in cycling, I, it, it is... Some of the same thing. We, we have a quite high volume, especially to be an um, ITU level red athlete. So we are normally on the bike five, six times a week. Uh, but that all depends if you're on training camp or not. For instance, when we are back home in our, Norway now, um, the, it is not very good for cycling outdoor because it's cold, it's dark, and it's wet, and uh, snow, and everything. So when we are at home in November, December, January, we, we, we maybe go down to three times a week, but then it, then it's maybe maximum one is an easy session and the rest is intervals. Intervals. Then we have two good interval sessions a week on the bike. So so then then we have a higher workload on on the higher intensity, and, and that that could be up to seventy five minutes of threshold sets. Hmm. Uh, and we also have start early. We start quite early to have brick session. We have brick session. It lasts up to four hours uh, indoor in the winter time, and uh, during that break session, maybe we do one part of, let's say, 40 minutes of bike intervals, and then we do around 8 k's of running intervals, and go back on the bike again and do 30, 40 more minutes on the bike, and then we go on the run and do six to eight k of running intervals afterwards, and that's really, a really demanding a session. Yeah, it sounds uh, lovely. <laughs> Yeah, it's really lovely. It takes all the day, and uh, 
just just sitting indoor and sweating and uh, getting off to drink and it's just just a beautiful life. So no, but but in serious, uh, that is one of the thing we did. That is a tough session, but we see that if you mix threshold session within, in, for instance, in two disciplines, you can have a higher workload than if you do it just in one uh, discipline. So, so, so that is one thing we have been trying to de- develop a lot during the years. But that's something we mostly do when we are back home in Norway. And, and how many brick workouts per week do you do on you, usually? Uh, is, is it one per week typically or do you do more? Uh, in, it's normally one per week. Uh, but but the, when it's coming up to the season or, or you, the races, we can have a little bit more. Uh, for instance, the, but it is like... It is never, it's not often more than two, one to two. Yeah. Would, yeah. And, and what, what about when you are on training camp? Then how, how does the cycling change? Yeah, yes, when you're on training camp, we we have a lot more volume, of course, um, uh, which means that we have uh, at this time of the year we are going to Sierra Nevada next week. Then we will probably have um, at least one four to five hours uh, session a week, and at least two to three around three hours. Uh, one of the things that uh, we are at least seven or eight weeks a year at Sierra Nevada, uh, and that is uh, um, on the mountaintop. So every time we go out for a bike ride, we have uh, at least 28 Ks of uh, continuous climbing back home. So uh, you can see that we we can say that we do a lot of hill climbing and when, when you're on training camp, and we do all a lot of intervals there on the hills. And uh, as I said, that all sessions are ending up with uh, at least one hour, 30, one hour, 40 minutes of uh, climbing. So if you go for a three hour session, it's just you cruise down to the valley and you have a little loop of maximum one hour, then you go up again. So I think that may get a big difference in your cycling fitness. And and uh, when speaking of that, uh, before we go into the run, uh, the the altitude camps in Sierra Nevada. When do you want to uh, go back down, come back down from altitude in relation to the races? Uh, that that all, um, uh, that depends a little bit of what kind of races. Uh, okay, when we are in Sierra Nevada, that is quite high altitude, that two thousand three hundred meter. So we live at that altitude and also train at that altitude of course when you go biking we go a little bit lower before we go back up again but most of the training is at that altitude when we are at that camp that for instance before we, the Bermuda race we was there uh, then we're going down to, to, to sea level at around yeah. it, it depends on the season but uh, 10 to 14 days before the race that is very safe yeah. uh, but we also see that during the summer, this summer we were eight weeks in Pont Romeu in the Pyrenees, but that's 1850 meters. So that is not so demanding on the body. So, so there we have uh, been in the altitude and go straight to, straight to, to, to the races. Uh, let's say we be in altitude and we, re- we race two of the three days after uh, we come down to sea level. And, and that also works fine. And the, for instance, this year we do, did that during the season, but then we also, the final race, uh, World Championship in Gold Coast, because of other races, then we went down to uh, from altitude four weeks before the big event to the World Championship. Yeah, okay. Uh, that, that you see, we have a window there at, the, at that time also. Yeah, uh, mm-hmm. and, and going to the run then, uh, finally, how, how do you structure the run training? Oh, as I said, it's very easy. A lot of volume, and then we have uh, at least two, two to three interval session a week. Uh, but no, uh, the run training is the most complex in many ways. It, it is not that running is difficult, but because that is where you need to take a very big individual uh, approach uh, to, to running, because you have athletes with different backgrounds. And we see that our athletes coming from, for instance, swimming background, uh, except Christian. Uh, everyone need to be lower on volume than Christian. Christian is for swimming, so he is one of the few I know that can do almost whatever you want in training. But all are coming from swim, swimming background, it take much longer time to develop the the the, the, the muscle and uh, the, the ligaments so they can tolerate the, the volume they needed. So they are 
normally lower in volume than our best athletes. So, so we need to have a very different approach to each athlete. And that is one of the, the challenging thing. And we had to say that, of course, uh, we have uh, some of the athletes having a lot of injuries. Uh, and some of them can just tolerate maybe 60, 70 percent of the volume that our best athletes on the team have. And that is the coaching part to, to see who can do what and what is too much and what is too little to find the, ba- the balance. Um, how, 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 do you man- how do you manage that? How uh, Do you have any any cues, any signals that you look for? Is there anything that you can do to try to prevent injuries before they happen? <laughs> if you have the answer on that, uh, that would be <laughs> I'll, really I'll cool. sell it. I'll sell it to you for uh, muchos dineros. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, um, I think that um, one of the thing is that uh, if you are with athletes, paying close attention to them, if they're very good in um, writing their training uh, diary, training peaks. Uh, then you can, as a good coach, you will see the size signals and then you hopefully can stop it before it's just too late. But, but it, it is always a, a challenging because I have some athletes that always coming back to some small injuries and we are very low in volume and then we try to do a little bit intervals and then come back again. Uh, so, so it's difficult to know, but you more you are with athletes, you see the athletes, you know the athletes, and uh, you're reading the training diary, and they are able to write a good training diary, we are, they are honest about their feeling, then I think we can solve most of it. And, of course, you need to do some training to try to avoid the injury. Uh, and the uh, basis training, the strengths, conditions, stuff like that. Um, and that is also, also something we try to pay attention to. Yeah. Uh, and uh, speaking about that injury prevention, training load in general, we've mentioned that as well. And one of the keys there is doing a lot of low intensity training. Are there any other things that you can do to manage training load in addition to what we've already talked about, about that and about reading the training diaries, etc.? Uh, of course, we, we, are, we are paying attention to, uh, for instance, when we are at altitude, we pay a lot of attention to the mood of the athletes, um, the weight. Uh, if, they're, if they're losing weight in altitude, that's never a good sign. That is some, uh, and they lose appetite. And that is something we try to optimize very much to find out that they don't do that. And of course, you're measuring... Uh, the heart, re, heart uh, rest rate, and we also tried some testing with heart rate variability, but we found that a little bit difficult to have good readings about that. Uh, we do uh, we using the oximeter and uh, to to see what the uh, ox- oxygen uh, in the blood are in the morning. Uh, pay a little bit attention to the urine and stuff like that, but but the, it is always the, the dialogue with the the coach athletes uh, thing that do, we can look and see. And uh, for instance, of course, especially on training camp, it's very easy to, to, to do that on the right time. But it still happens that some athletes, uh, they are overdoing a little bit too much. They're having a little bit bad day. And instead of going by alone at their own intensity, that should be right for them at that time. They're going with a group. And that's the thing, also thing we try to stress that for us it's not, okay, we are a group and we are trying to train together, but it's always at your right intensity. So if you're having a bad day, you just go by yourself at your own intensity, take it easy and, and not stress it as to try to keep up with them. It's just to stay on the wheel, you can recover and not. We, we don't do it like the, that way. Mm. If you're not able to keep up with the other guys, because you are tired on it, the rest are taking more easy. You just go by yourself. Yeah. Or answer yeah. yeah. A couple more questions about the training, how you train. Uh, first, periodization. How, can you give a brief overview of how, if you periodize? Uh, well, yes, uh, that, that's a tricky question. Uh, uh, we periodize in a way. Um, uh, but it is not like, I, I, I cannot tell you about a lot of uh, the, big models about periodization and stuff like that, because I don't believe in it. What I believe in is variation in training. And uh, 
we put in different training load to different part of the year and we are have a different training load in different disciplines and stuff like that but what we see that especially on uh, some of the more demanding training camps at altitude especially then we have a really strict periodization uh, because that worked really well on training camps uh, that then that is normally it's a four day day cyclus. We have a first day we do at least two intervals. In day two we do a really long training day, all in low intensity. On day three we do at least two interval session. And day four we have a half rest day. And every twelfth or sixteenth day we have one rest day, totally rest. So that we see that that worked really well. Mm. Uh, but, but if you do that back home. It is more like in back home you have the whole life for most people are structured around Monday to Friday when you go to work and you have the weekends off. So so even they are professional athletes, they also see the influence of the life to other people. For instance, access to the swimming pool and tracks and stuff like that. So when we are back home, we do it a little bit differently. But what about over the... More, sorry, go sorry. on. No, all in all, it is, is try to optimize the perfect training load, the highest possible training load, and uh, do that in, in a good way. That is the key factor, actually. Yeah. Do, is mm. there a, what's the at what times of year do you have what kind of intensity? Like, do you do more of the higher intensity when you get closer to the race season, or do you have pretty similar intensity distributions year round? Uh, uh, mainly, we do much of the same. Intensity. For us, that means we are paying a lot of attention to building up the anaerobic threshold and working around that. That we do. Yeah, we start building up uh, this season today uh, for next season, and uh, and they will allow to have a little bit easy start up this week. Okay, some had some testing in the lab, but but after that we go straight to intervals. Um, uh, we build it up. Uh, we are not starting. All maximum at once but we're starting with intervals from first week and these intervals are the basic during the year and our variation we have a lot of variation in how long they are how long of the are the intervals uh, how, how short is the, uh, the rest period and that we have a lot of variation on and but and of course when we're getting closer to races we tend to do some more rate uh, training closer to race pace or even above race space. Um, but uh, we see that some of the research that done in Norway, if you put in training, what in what kind of how you build up your intervals during the season, it actually doesn't matter so much. It is normal you, you try to go higher and higher intensity close to the races. But if you just do that, you, you missed uh, you, your threshold will go below us, you need to keep that up all the time. And some studies in Norway show that in what way you do it, it doesn't matter so much. Yeah. What's matter, it, 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 what kind of, uh, that you do the intervals. <laughs> so, so, so it's more that we be doing most of the things all year round. Yeah, yeah. So, so would it be a fair assessment to say that you, you, your primary focus is really building the en- engine and training the physiology rather than... Uh, than focusing on like the anything else like race specificity or that sort you really want to focus on on raising that aerobic threshold and you mentioned that it's a very aerobic sport of course and and is that building of the engine the main priority for you yes that is totally right that's the main yeah uh so uh, let me see here scrolling down my question list um i have a few questions from uh, other people as well uh, that uh, i asked for their opinions here is one that i think is really good it seems that all your athletes are very very strong bike riders and yeah. uh, and it has changed the dynamics of the race on the men's side in particular and is this a coincidence or is it a conscious effort uh, to really make the bike a strength of yours it, like have you identified the bike as one leg where there is the most room for improvement in uh, in WTS races these days. <laughs> okay, that, that's a complex uh, question, but uh, it it goes both way. Um, for for me as a coach, I see that most athletes they are 
they are de- they are depending on a st- strong strong swim and a strong run to win a race. Um, and I think that then you have a quite big limitation how we can deal with the race. Uh, if you are the fastest runner, it's very good. It will work out most of the time, like uh, Mario Morla. Uh, but for a lot of other athletes, you, you need to think of what else can I do to make an impact of a race. I, I, I'm really frustrated to see that I will see that around 50% of all that less racing, the WTS races, they have just one plan. This, that is to stay in the group and take it easy on the bike and then hope for a good run. And very often that that doesn't work. And a lot of them, they are just fighting for a top 20, 30 position all the, all the time. And then they need to think, what can I do to make an impact of the, a race and to make any difference? And... I see that most athletes and coaches that don't think that. Uh, so for us, for the bike, it's, it's not like we want to attack on the bike all the time. But for me, the, the bike part of triathlon is most important. Uh, it's it's an equal to the other disciplines. So if you are able to use the strength on the bike, you should do it. And um, we work to have that possibility. It's not like we are going to attack if, uh, all the time. But sometimes it's good for us to do it. And uh, sometimes we succeed and uh, sometimes we don't succeed. But at least we have tried. Most of the athletes in the Dolby test field never try. Yeah, and, and mo- most uh, countries have never swept a podium in, in a WTS no, race. So. No, they, they haven't. <laughs> but, but, but I can say that uh, <laughs> that is true. But I have to say that uh, in, uh, in Bermuda, first it was a little bit, in one way it's a coincidence because... Um, Kasper, he was, he said that he was not feeling that he was attacking. He was just having um, his turn on the front when he's pushing the gear, and then he was alone. And then he said, "Okay, let's go for it." Um, but the thing also, uh, because that is show a little bit how we work. Because when we are at training camp in uh, Sierra Nevada, we we were looking at the profile on on, on the bike course in Bermuda and. And we are discussing, okay, should we try to do something? No, we are training a lot of, in the mountains. Should we try to attack on the on the hill? Because it's just quite steep hill. But then we analyzed it and found out that, okay, the hill was just uh, uh, 45 seconds to one minute of far climbing. And we knew you, that, oh, is this something that the WTS races can? is go very hard for a short period of time. So when they put that right lead from the racing WTS up, up a hill, they will go all out all the time. So we, we knew that this, that was very difficult. But we see that they can push 500, 600 watts, but then they then need to rest at 200 watts the, the next five minutes so that we're ready for the next lap. So we actually found out, okay, what we do is try to, we, we, we were building a special, specific training where we try to attack on the, uh, on the top of the hill. Uh, not attack, but just be able to keep the, the pace up at the threshold intensity that is yeah. not too high but most of the, the field they need to need to go down to 200 watt for a few minutes to, to rest after the maximum effort up the up the hill uh, so 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 we were doing some uh, session uh, where we were trying to work on that and uh, i remember i got a text message from the, after the first session um, that christian uh, sent a message of, okay Hey, you did it! You you, you you destroyed everyone. No one survived the session, but but we will try once later. So okay, so we did this some little bit of adjustment on the, that course, and we and we tried again, and we found a way that uh, that worked, and we were able to work hard up the hill with the other, and then we can push hard going where we are up on the top and slightly downhill, and and that was actually. The, the thing that make the, the the difference and uh, and the biggest difference that we are we try we, we analyze the course before the race and we make a plan and we try to see if it's possible but it was not like okay we're going in and we will attack it was more like okay we train for it and if the possibility are there we will try to take it hmm. take the chance and let's see and uh, it doesn't seem that the other was thinking that way at that race. No. 
It didn't. I have to say, we were a little bit lucky. I, I think that uh, most athletes didn't take Casper too seriously because his ranking was not so high and uh, they didn't know how to react on him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that that's true. But uh, the hard work still needed to be done and it was it was done uh, done very, very well. Uh, what, yes, what... It, it, yeah, sorry. So, so yeah, yeah, what... he did, he did, yeah. So, sorry. <laughs> I want to move on to the next can... topic. Uh, so, so one one other question that I wanted to go into was: When do you begin with the real hard and serious work with the athletes that are focusing on maybe becoming WTS uh, and Olympic athletes at some point? Is it at what age? Is it junior youth, or is it later at under twenty three level? How how does that development path uh, play out for you in Norway? Uh, <laughs> It is a little bit. What you say? We uh, normally we start out when they are seventeen, eighteen, or juniors. Um, what we see that uh, most athletes in uh, Norway they come from different sport than uh, than triathlon, so they're not starting with the sport so young. Okay, now we have some triathlon clubs that having athletes. Doing triathlon when they are 12, 12, uh, 10, 12 years old. But normally, we start with our athletes a little bit late. And for instance, um, now it's the Youth Olympic Games in uh, Buenos Aires, and um, we have never had any athletes qualified for that. Uh, four years ago, Casper, uh, uh, he, he didn't qualify. He was not at the level at all, but he was starting the process to be a, a world class athlete, and he was building up his training volume. and uh, I think right now it's no one uh, in that age group that uh, that beat him, and uh, so, and we see that the countries that succeed in the youth Olympic Games is a lot of countries who start have a quite clear talent identification program starting quite early with athletes. Uh, I, I don't think that is necessary. Um, so for us, it's more like when they are juniors, we are starting them. As I started me. We christened when he was 17, and uh, yeah, some of the other when they were 16. So that's around the, the age. Yeah, but then yeah. when when you start with them around that age, you pretty quickly do you get into uh, if they are have the motivation and uh, they they are talented enough and they want to push for becoming a world class athlete, then you start to pretty quickly build up not not quickly build up the volume, but you immediately yeah. start the progression on uh, trying to work towards world-class performance is yeah. that correct yeah that is correct and uh, uh, the volume at that age they are increasing quite much uh, there's very strict control and but but one way when you do that you, you see the athletes who are motivated and who is not and uh, um, and as i said in many times i don't think that all athletes are more talented than other athletes I think uh, the the biggest gift there is their motivation, and I think that with the guidance we give them, they are able to to perform at that level. Yeah, what what sport backgrounds do the other guys? Except uh, Christian, you told us is from a swimming background. What what are the the Kasper and uh, and Gustav and Lotte? Uh, what sports are they from? Yeah, yeah, uh, Lotte. She's also for, from swimming. Uh, she was a really good sprinter in backstroke, especially. So, so that's not so uh, correlated to, to triathlon because uh, she was good in 15 meter backstroke, but uh, she was a good runner. <laughs> um, Jürgen, uh, you didn't mention, he was also, also a swimmer. But Casper, he came from karate uh, as a, um, a fighting sport. Uh, and then he started to do more running and then get into triathlon. The first year in triathlon, he was really bad in swimming. Um, I think that his first Nordic Championship, uh, he was lapped by Christian on the run. And that's not so many years ago. That's four years ago, uh, three years ago. <laughs> uh, and, and Gustav, he, he was actually a really talented cyclist. He is, and uh, if you're into cycling, you know that one of the biggest races you can win as a um, young athlete is the six days of racing in Sweden. Um, and he won that when he was 16 and started to doing a little bit triathlon. So he was coming from cycling, but he was also a very good runner. But uh, his swim- swimming was not so good, so he started to work with his swim at, at that time. Yeah. 
Okay, interesting. But but uh, all in all, you'd say that uh, motivation is uh, the biggest factor in in success. And uh, do you look at all at the physiological testing and things like that when you, uh, or how how does that play a part in the development? Uh, yes, uh, as I said, that um, uh, we have very strict intensity control, so we do a lot of testing. Uh, but when we started with the athletes, uh, uh, we started with some very basic tests. We do an 800 meter swim and 5000 meter running test. That is a basic test. But when you are on the national team, we go to the lab quite often. So, for instance, our elite athletes, they go to the lab at least six times a year to, to have all the tests. For instance, they are in the lab these days now because we are going to the altitude next week. So, to be really good controlling what we do in training in altitude. We need to know their level at this time in swimming, biking and running. So I have three days of testing mm. and that we do um, at least five, six times a year. That's more than most do. But as I said, that if your treasure power on the bike is increasing 20, 30% within a season, that is quite normal. Uh, you need to work on the right intensity. So, so what level you can work in on the camp now in October is not the same when we're back on the same um, hills again in uh, April. Yeah. So, so, so we need to know that. We, 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 we cannot, uh, okay, we, we can guess and by using lat uh, out in the field, we know quite okay, but we want to be sure that our athletes are training at the right intensity. So we have tests on every training camp before and after and after to know what was the progression. Yeah. So, and and the, the listeners of this podcast, they, many of them are quite tech savvy and, and like the, the, the gadgets and all sorts of things. Is there anything other you've mentioned? So lab testing, you mentioned power meters on both the bike and the run. Are you, are you using the run power meters regularly every day in training? Or uh, Yes, um, we have actually a very good um, uh, re- relation and see we have good data from the street running power yes. sensor uh, and we use that and we have uh, data for most of the, the races on them. So we actually, uh, yeah, we, we believe that the accuracy of that is good enough. Mm. One thing, uh, yeah, yeah, we do a lot of field testing on lactate, I think, uh, that we take around 1,000 lactate tests every year. So the our best athletes are uh, testing are maybe up to 200 tests every year, uh, samples we take. Yep in all training session. Uh, one thing we use, especially in the altitude, is the oximeter you know, to, to see the oxygen uh, in the muscle. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that is quite interesting. It tells you a little bit about how you adapt to, to the altitude, of course, but also, especially on the bike, uh, when you're having a measurement on the quadriceps, we can see how efficiency you are in your technique, for instance. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so that is uh, some. Thing you use. Uh, I, I forgot to mention that in swimming, you use a Canadian system called Tritonwear. We used to measuring uh, the distance per stroke and uh, really good in analysis in stroke analysis. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Uh, and we also, you of course, use heart rate or, in, in the swim and in, in all all the sessions. So that's about it. Okay. Is, uh, is, is it more? <laughs> okay, is that's more tools we can use. You can. Uh, well, you, you mentioned you mentioned HRV. I personally use use HRV, and and I tried it a little bit in coaching. I found it yeah. difficult in coaching, to be honest. To but but for myself as an athlete, I do find it very useful and very accurate, actually. So uh, yeah. so so maybe that's something that's worth, worth looking looking into again. Uh, yeah. HRV for training is a great app to take a one minute test that's very accurate and re- reliable, and it's been validated in several studies. So I can recommend that. Yeah, uh, yes, yeah, so I heard about that, and I also been some meeting with some people who are delivering that, and uh, I, 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 get, I get to know about that in uh, in the night uh, when I started working for Polar, and uh, and they have patented the system for that in the nineties. So it's a quite old system, actually. Oh, okay, yeah, I didn't know that. Uh, so, f- getting to the, f- the the end of the interview, I have one or two more questions, though, because I really enjoy this, and uh, I want to thank you already because this be- this has been such yeah, a great interview. Yeah, that's a starting video. Yeah. Uh, so, so the first one would be: What would be your main tips for young athletes that want to make it uh, to become a world class athlete? Um, <laughs> motivation is the key, and take your time. 
uh, it seems that our athletes are getting good, quite young, but they, they have uh, many years of good training. And uh, so take your time and uh, it will and be motivated so you can do the, the daily training yeah. and then you will succeed. And for age group athletes that want to get faster at the sprint and Olympic distance in particular, although you can speak for other distances as well, uh, of course, if you want to, uh, what would be your main tips for them? I think the most important thing is that they remember that it's an aerobic sport um, and they're working on the, the thing that make a big difference in the time and not work, uh, spend a lot of time working on the small details that doesn't matter at all. I see a lot of age group athletes, uh, w- when we have uh, talking about our training and what we do, we get some really strange questions. Uh, okay, uh, uh, that may be a bad thing to say that uh, there are many they are so into the details uh, that they have forgot the basics. Yeah, uh, there's uh, there's a saying in Swedish. I don't know if you have it in Norwegian as well. That uh, well, it's in English as well. Now that I think of it, you can't see the forest <laughs> for the trees. Uh, I, yes. I guess that <laughs> that's sort of it, it, it is something like that. Uh, so, so, so do the basic, get the basic right, and remember it's an Arabic sport. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's uh, start to wrap up with some rapid fire questions uh, that uh, you can answer in uh, just fifteen seconds or less. And the first one is: What's you your favorite? That quite, uh, yeah, that's quite it, difficult it, for me. But it's, I will it's a challenge. It's a challenge. You'll have to speak quickly. What's yeah. your favorite book, blog, or resource related to triathlon? Uh, to be honest, uh, I don't read too much of them. I don't find them so not so interesting. So. Um, Sorry. <laughs> Blank. Okay. Uh, perfect. Honest answer. Uh, what do you wish you had known or had it done differently at some point in your career? Well, I say that if I knew today what I knew 20 years ago, we would let myself. But um, <laughs> now, uh, one thing is I have a tendency to overdo things uh, with my athletes the last year. So, yeah, I'll try not to do that mistake again. <laughs> And finally, who's somebody in triathlon that you look up to? Um, as an old athlete, and actually an old athlete racing a lot of Ironman, I have to say that Mark Allen was my favorite triathlete, and uh, and also his coaching business today. Um, uh, yeah, uh, he is one I, I, I look up to. Yeah, good one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Odil. This has been absolutely fascinating. I really, really enjoyed it. And uh, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to come on to talk to us and uh, teach us some some important lessons about uh, everything that you've learned over the years and uh, and used to make Norway that superpower that I have to say <laughs> I predicted it would be <laughs> a few months ago, <laughs> before Bermuda <laughs> happened at least. So thank you very much. Well, th- thank you, and uh, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure, and uh, yeah, thank you. There you have it. I hope that you enjoyed that interview as much as I did talking to Arild. So a few key takeaways as usual. First, triathlon is an aerobic sport and uh, that was somewhat of a recurring theme here in a lot of the training discussions that we had with Arild and uh, some practical implications that uh, the Norwegian triathletes apply here are first, they do big volume, but a lot of that volume is at low intensity. And second, when they do hard workouts, they do longer intervals than seems to be the norm on the short course triathlon scene. Of course, these workouts can still be very, very hard. They can be super hard, like uh, bucket workouts. You want to puke afterwards. I don't know exactly if that's how hard they do it, but uh, but they can be very hard. But uh, the point here is that they're still focusing on maximizing that aerobic development with uh, not doing those super short uh, speed work intervals that, uh, that other triathletes on the WTS uh, racing scene might do. Actually, they do do that because I see it a lot on social media media when i with the elite athletes that i follow there so it is different compared to what seems to be the norm and that i found very interesting and finally the other takeaway that i have is that when you have less resources you have less margin for error and uh, norway is a perfect example of this they don't have a lot of athletes so they really have to get the best out of the athletes that they have and that that means small margin for error they need to to really really maximize what they get out of them 
And one of the examples that we talked about here is that uh, in Norway, they do a lot of lab test testing and field lactate testing to make sure that the athletes train at the right intensities, practice intensity control, and also that they do things like adapt properly to, to their altitude training. Uh, for age groupers, the same principle apply that you ha- you have not a lot of time to train usually. So you definitely need to try to optimize what you get out of that time. And that is, uh, I hope, one of the reasons that you listen to, to this podcast. It might not mean that you go and do six lab tests per week. I probably think that it won't for almost any of you. But the do the most with what you have principle should still apply. And be very, very smart and, uh, and uh, tactical about what you, what you do. But also know the priorities uh, because you can't get hung up on the minutia when there are big levers that might be untapped. So that's another important part of, of this. As usual, you can find the show notes for this episode on thattriathlonshow.com. And if you have comments or questions, leave them on that show notes page and I will get back to you. I have some related episodes about uh, really high-performance triathlon, elite uh, short-course triathlon and high-performance coaching. And those episodes are linked to in the episode description and on the show notes. They are number 26, high-performance coaching with elite coach Paulo Sousa. And episode 83, High Performance and Long-Term Athlete Development with Mark Elliott. Uh, so check those out if you're interested. Also, a link to an article about uh, on triathlon.org that is titled Norway Becomes First Men's Team to Sweep WTS Podium in Bermuda. Definitely worth a read if you are not quite familiar with the background of what we're talking about here with the podium sweep. In the next episode... You will hear Lars Finanger, who is uh, an age group athlete from the United States, and he will discuss how he successfully trained for and raced Ironman Texas on less than nine hours per week. And uh, he, interestingly, had a very strong swim focus in his training. So a lot of his training time was spent in the pool. Finally, some house cleaning items. The strength training plan that I've been talking about a few weeks ago is now also available as a PDF version. Previously, it was only up on Training Peaks, but now I sell it directly through my website as a PDF version in addition to that Training Peaks version. And if you buy the Training Peaks version, if you prefer that, you can email me your Training Peaks receipt, and uh, then you will also I'll, I'll send you the PDF version for free. And uh, another thing that I updated there is that I also have added an exclusive email series with additional in-depth information about strength training that will help you get those extra marginal gains out of that program. And that is, of course, completely free when you buy the plan. So you'll get information about how to sign up for that email series. The feedback so far has been really great, so I'm happy about that, and I wish all of you who are on that program uh, good luck with uh, your keeping going on that program. I think there's almost 100 athletes right now that are already using the plan, so so that's great. And uh, definitely, definitely, if you're interested in doing strength training now that the off-season is approaching, you should check it out. So go to scientifictriathlon.com, and under training plans, you have strength training, and that's where you can learn more about it. All right, finally, big thanks to our sponsors, Ventum, that you can find on VentumRacing.com. They make the world's fastest triathlon bikes, and uh, you can check them out, both the Ventum 1, the flagship model, and the Ventum C, the super bike at an entry-level price point. And whichever one of those models you choose, you can get a free training wheel to race wheel upgrade when you apply the promo code that triathlon show. And a big thank you to Stack that you can find on stackzero.com. They make the world's quietest indoor trainers. No noise, no wear and tear on the tire. You can check all the models out on stackzero.com. And if you buy any of the models, use the promo code TTS20 to get a whopping 20% off your purchase. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon. Mm-hmm.